Hi everybody, I'm Ed Baker and it's my pleasure today to welcome you to ARC or the Addiction Recovery Channel. ARC is a, a channel that is devoted uh, to people with substance use disorder or really anybody who cares about a person with substance use disorder. We're here to help you to understand what brain addiction is, to help raise consciousness, to be a part of this uh, groundswell of compassion that we see in our communities today for people suffering from this disease. <clears throat> it's my pleasure uh, today to introduce our guest. Our guest today is uh, Cliff Bauman. Thank you, Eddie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Cliff. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's estimated today that there are approximately 23 million people in recovery from addiction. What's, what's interesting is that this has been a relatively silent population up until recently. More recently, people in recovery are speaking out. And that's the purpose of um, Cliff's visit with us today. And I guess I would like to just start right there. I'd, I'd like to know, Cliff, what is, it, what is it that's driving you, that's motivating you, to come and speak in a public forum about something as personal as recovery? Absolutely, Eddie. Thanks for asking that question. That's a, that's a great starting point. Um, you know, for about a year and a half into recovery, I was kind of living in the shadows of recovery, working my program, trying to stay clean, um, and do doing a lot of things for myself and not necessarily reaching out to others as much as I, I would have liked to. And now I'm seeing all of this news on TV, you know, op the opioid mm -hmm. epidemic, and um, I'm hearing these incredibly uh, hurtful stories of folks who pass away as a result of using opiates. And, uh, who you know have lifetime struggles with with these um, addictions, and it's not often that I see you know represented in the news or on TV a positive story of recovery. Um, people who have been able to find a way to overcome addiction and move move on and be able to to start their lives. So I, I want to I want people to know that that's possible. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're, we are right with you on that. I'd like to thank you for your courage. I'd like to recognize your courage and your concern. It's not an easy task uh, to come and speak about, again, uh, matters that are, are so personal. Mm -hmm. So let's begin there. Let's, let's take a look at, at your journey as a young man and what it was like. What was it like at the time when you first began to realize that that substance use was was a, a serious problem for you it's a great question so it took many years for me to reach what what I like to call a breaking point or a rock bottom mm -hmm. um, and basically for me that looked like desperation I was desperate to you know overcome what I was dealing with, the depression, anxiety, and move on with my life and be able to do something positive. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had struggled with addiction since I was, you know, around 13 or 14. And as a lot of people say, you know, it started with smoking pot and, you know, um, and alcohol and those kinds of things, and then eventually progressed um, throughout high school and then also into college. And I had a few run-ins with the law in high school um, nothing too serious, but most of all, I realized the problem was inside me. So I was in college, and it was junior year, and you know I, I was getting good grades. I I had a, a difficult um, course of study, and um, at the same time, I was seriously struggling with my addictive personality, mm -hmm. um, especially with regard to drugs. You know, it I started using um, harder drugs, and led me into a period of depression. Um, very very severe depression and anxiety and just, you know, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror mm -hmm. um, anymore and, and see, you know, who I, who I thought I was supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. It's a poignant, uh, poignant beginning uh, to your story. Would you say that 
I, I want to like diverge for a second because you made an interesting point that you started with with one drug that there's a lot of um, publicity now is sort of called a recreational drug, and then you went on to other more serious or or or, or more harmful types right. of behaviors. What was that like? Was that was that a gradual progression? Were you aware? Yeah, were you were you did you have consciousness of the fact that you were getting worse, that your symptoms, your addiction was uh, gaining power in your life, or was it something that was subtle? Very good question. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually, I've you know, before now, I, I haven't really thought about whether that was a, a subtle transition or, you know, something that just hit me abruptly, and I was like, mm -hmm. okay, this is getting to be too much. Mm -hmm. um, and now that I think of it, I think it it was more of a subtle transition because. Uh, Throughout college, I started, you know, using ecstasy, um, cocaine, and eventually, and, and it was over a period of a couple of years, mm -hmm. I think from freshman year in college to junior year, mm -hmm. where I would have these uh, bouts mm -hmm. um, of maybe using on the weekend and then stopping for two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. Maybe I had a test to study for or something. Sure, sure. And then I'd go right back to it. Sure. And eventually, I started, when I, when I had these bouts, they became longer and um, they, they were much less spaced out than they were before. And so I was really getting into deep, some deep stuff and it's almost like there was kind of a block. I couldn't really see that, what I was turning into. I think my initial signal was my friend's reactions and uh, okay. my reactions to uh, other people and, and I wasn't, Felt like I wasn't liked as much, and I got really self-conscious about that. So. Sure, sure, that makes it makes a lot of sense. I think one of the um, tricks that addiction plays on on people with addiction is we all have internal processes that defend us from feeling emotions that are uncomfortable, even if they're associated with the truth about us. So sometimes we'll avoid the truth about us. In this case there's an addiction developing. Mm -hmm. So as we avoid it, the addiction has free reign to in fact get worse. So it was concerned friends that brought to your attention that, hey, you're not the cliff that, that we know. You know, what, what's up with you? Is that kind of what began to happen? Yeah, yeah, essentially that's what happened. Um, you know, it, it's not to say that the friends that I had were overly concerned or could, it was very obvious to them that I was changing. Yeah. I feel like it was more, it was a little more obvious to myself in that hanging out with these friends, I didn't get the same reactions as I used to. I, I didn't feel like I was included as much mm -hmm. um, in parties or events. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would just end up going home and using using substances by myself, and that's, that's where I began to find pleasure, and I think that's where the isolation sure, began. Sure, sure. One of the hallmarks of addiction I is yeah. isolation, and it's interesting because I think what you're saying is, what I'm hearing you say is that the reason their responses resonated with you was largely because you were asking yourself the same questions. Why don't I look like me in the mirror? Mm -hmm. What, what is going on here? What is up? How did you, how did you eventually, you have, that's the question you have to answer before you get motivated to move into recovery. Mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you answer that question? Did you need help to answer that? How did you answer that question? It was uh, maybe the biggest question of my life and I definitely needed help. I could not see that I needed help. Yeah. I, um, I was absolutely desperate. I think the most desperate I felt in my life. Um, I had plenty of support from family. They know what I've gone through for a long time. But you know, they, they also knew that I wasn't actively seeking any help for, for a long time. And so they kind of let me do my own thing. So I had to figure this out by myself over years that something was up and eventually junior year of college I had a, a breakdown over winter break. It was a very dark period of my life and I um, I got very desperate. I ended up going to see a therapist and I told her what was going on and I just kind of let it all out. I just told the truth, you know, admitted that I was really having a hard time trying to balance school and then, 
my addicted life, which was a yeah. huge part of my sure. life at that time too. Sure. So I was told that I was essentially leading a double life. And something about that phrase, double life, that clicked with me. And I saw that, you know, it's, exp I'm ex expending more energy than I, I need to. You know, I, I have these motivations with academics, but at the same time, I'm sort of counter counteracting them with my substance use. And I didn't feel like I was going anywhere. So it was a, a therapist. First, first of all, it was what you call desperation, mm -hmm. or we could call it motivation. It got you to break through, a lot of people like to say it's denial, but, but it doesn't really sound like denial. It sounds like reluctance or shame or the inability or not knowing how to reach out for help. I don't think it's people really denying that there's something going on with them. Mm -hmm. They just don't know what to do. Right. So you, you broke through that and you actually became motivated enough to reach out to a therapist and yes. she helped you? Yes. She helped me by introducing me to, so I, I was on, um, I, w I was a junior at, at the University of Vermont, mm -hmm. and she opened up the avenue for me to speak with the director of the campus recovery program at mm -hmm. UVM. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that existed. Um, I didn't know that it could help me. You know, that was the last thing I thought, that this, getting into this program would be the, you know, the, the start of a, of a new beginning. Yeah you will but but it was um yeah so I, I reached out to my therapist and she connected me with someone in recovery who was in this campus recovery program he was right. a, he was a post bachelorette student and after meeting and having coffee with him i began to feel less alone yeah i instantly felt well this person has seen has been through what i've been through mm -hmm. and now they're getting help too so maybe i can do that and they're going on to do great things. They're going to graduate school. Maybe I can do that. And that's what, that's what this is about. Yeah. That's sending that word out there to the general public. Maybe there's some young people out there or any people out there. They could be college students or just other people with addiction who will hear you and say, hey, maybe I can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing, one, one thought that you've kind of provoked in me is that we hear a lot about, and, and research will show and validate, that availability drives use. If there's a lot of a drug available, people will tend to use it more. Availability drives use. We've seen this many, many times. Mm -hmm. Isn't the same thing true with help? Doesn't availability drive seeking help? Like in your case, there happened to be available in the school setting a campus recovery network, counselors available to you, where you could go and you could reach out. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. So after I took that step, like I said, I had no idea that this existed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's still being developed and these, these programs are popping up all over the country, which, mm -hmm. which is really nice. Mm -hmm. I really like to see that, but it, um, it, it, it didn't seem like it was tremendously openly available to students. Uh, I didn't see posters or signs or, or advertisements. Um, but you know, it, it turned out to be very accessible. It was right in the um, the Davis Center at UVM, this big building with a ton of events and and programs meet there and yeah, so yeah. I, I walk in there and it's this nice studio yeah. um, you know comfortable places to sit down and we meet in a circle and we we meet for about an hour a week and we talk about our experience in recovery and we go through um, different articles related to recovery and it's really a promotion of just bringing students together to talk about their their shared experiences and the struggles of being a college student um, being around so much partying. Yeah, and yeah. The, uh, the availability. Right. You know, the things that are available to us are uh, sometimes can drive, you know, our, our behaviors. Exactly. So it must not be, I mean, for you, for your story, uh, Cliff, you're, 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 you, you, you must continuously be faced with the opportunity to use substances. What, 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 is it, what is it like 
to be a person in recovery. How long are you in recovery now, if I might ask? Yeah, of course. So my sobriety date is May 12th, 2016. Okay. So I've been in recovery for a little over 17 months. Okay. And it gets easier as time goes on, I will say that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, everything. W when I was just starting out in recovery, I didn't think that I would have relief from my depression. I didn't think I'd have relief from, from my anxiety. Mm -hmm. I no longer had these avenues to mm -hmm. help fix these problems that I used before. Mm -hmm. Substances. So I needed to redevelop or, or focus on different habits that would keep me sober. Mm -hmm. and keep me, keep me away from, from a drug. And so I, you know, it, luckily I was still in school, so there was a plan laid out for me there. You know, these syllabi I had to follow and these classes and these mm -hmm. exams. So getting a in a routine is, is often very helpful for me. And being in recovery, it's not easy, but life is so much better yeah. for me than what it was before. Just like yeah. the amount of joy and happiness I experience on a daily basis. Like just waking up, I'm excited to wake up in the morning <laughs> with a coffee and do a crossword. That's and so like, good. Um, I, you know, I'm actually living and I don't have to constantly worry about, you know, the next way to, to suppress this feeling, you know, the, the next way to procure this drug or something, to, to feel a different way. It's. I, I find different things to, to help with that. That's, that's so beautiful. And, um, you know, we know now today from, from decades of research that addiction is a brain disease, mm -hmm. that the brain is fully compromised, fully impaired, hijacked, some people call it. And, and the general public really doesn't in, understand the extent of that, how deep that runs. You know, it's not, you know, from Friday afternoon till Monday morning, mm -hmm. when, you, when you get to that certain point where you reach what we call addiction, it's from Friday afternoon to Friday afternoon, right? 24-7. Right. And, and the interests that you would normally be drawn to, the healthy interests in life, relationships, hobbies, mm -hmm. you know, um, endeavors, uh, di different types of things that excite us, all that is, is inaccessible to you right. because your brain is so focused on drugs. It takes, like it's been, would you say 17 months now, maybe 18 mm -hmm. months of recovery? Your brain is beginning to heal. The old cliff, when you look in the mirror, I'll bet you know who you're looking at. I do. Tell us a little bit about that guy that you see in the mirror today. It's What's going question. on with you? <laughs> A lot of good things. Um, you know, I, I, I can now look in the mirror and <clears throat> feel comfortable with who I am as a person um, rather than who I want to be or who I perceive myself to be or what I think I should be. You know, when I was in active addiction or I, when I was using substances and alcohol, mm -hmm. um, when I was addicted, I couldn't really see like you said, my brain was essentially hijacked. Um, the chemistry in my brain was, was uh, you know, thrown off in such a way that the things that used to interest me, for instance, playing drums, um, I was very interested in herpetology, studying snakes and reptiles. I'd always go out in the woods, go on hiking trips and stuff. <laughs> I lost these. I, I, I enjoyed them so much when I was a kid, and that was a, you know, that was, not an instant gratification, that was a long-term happiness that I had. You know, I could spend hours at a time and then nights looking forward to doing it the next day. And uh, with substances, I lo not only did I lose that, but they precipitated the depression, the anxiety, the, the negative feelings, sure. the loss of relationships. Yeah. So I, I may have just gone off a little. No, no, question, no, you're describing it perfectly. That, that it becomes global. Right. It becomes your world and you can't get out of it but but with recovery you you find you 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 recover mm -hmm. your old interests you recover that the potential for health in your brain and you were just describing some things that are important to you today mm -hmm. like playing the drums <clears throat> herpetology which i think is i think it's wonderful how different individuals will find something that's unique to them 
because that's the way their brain operates. You, yeah. When you're in touch with who you are, you find things that bring you pleasure, that bring you joy. Mm -hmm. What is it that, um, tell us a little bit about what you're studying in, in school. Well, what is that like, your academic pursuits? <clears throat> right now I am, I am pursuing a master's degree in medical science mm -hmm. at the University of Vermont. When I was an undergrad, I majored in dietetics and nutrition. Mm -hmm. I've always been interested in health and wellness. Um, I exercise a lot, I, I do yoga, um, I cook. I, I'm very interested in how the, the body functions as a, you know, a, a, uh, an individual who is affected by these outside circumstances, environment, and, mm -hmm. and, f and how we eat and how we uh, socialize, all of this affects our health. Yes. So I'm, I'm very yes. interested mm -hmm. in um, becoming a physician. I'd love to um, eventually be able to treat patients holistically <coughs> um, rather than just focusing on a one-time fix it, you know, take a medication, um, get better for, for a short period, and then you get these side effects. Mm -hmm. And you're not really looking at the root cause of the mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. I think what our society needs is more of a preventative approach in looking at, okay, what are these behaviors and, and uh, habits that are developing early on mm -hmm. that, that lead to diseases and, and conditions? And can we, you know, later in life when, when these diseases occur, can we look back and say, oh, how can we treat these? Can we change, alter someone's diet? Mm -hmm. Can we help with their exercise patterns? But I do think prescribing medications in, cer in sure. circumstances is of extremely course. important. Of course, of course. So do you think that your, um, your journey into and out of addiction will help you to understand your, your clients and your patients as you move forward? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I think I'd look at a patient in, in a completely different way. I think that I, you know, I, I would be able to see through the the outside, you know, appearance and and what they seem to be going through, and and just sort of open my heart and be able to share a, in a common struggle mm -hmm. of an experience. You know, I I struggled physically, I struggled mentally, and I know that I knew that through you know different getting help in different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I was able to not be cured in, in a sense, but but to be treated in a, in a mm -hmm. healthy way throughout my life, and, and I want to bring that to other, other people. I think that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful and concise uh, uh, description, Cliff. Now, what you just mentioned is really interesting. Uh, when you said not be cured, to me that triggers a whole line of thought. So the idea of not being cured what what exactly what exactly does that mean so i like to think of it as if i if i were to go back to using say one day i just decide oh i want to take a drink or i want to go back to the pipe mm -hmm. i know because it's happened to me before that if i do that mm -hmm. this is a progressive illness if i do that it'll be worse than the time it was before mm -hmm. meaning that you know the high is going to be shorter, the come down is going to be longer. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this happen to myself. Mm -hmm. I, I told you May 12th was my sobriety date. Well, mm -hmm. my original sobriety date was sometime in, in March, okay? <laughs> and so I, I relapsed once. And, you know, when I relapsed, it started out with one pill. Mm -hmm. That's it. And um, it eventually led to my drug of choice, methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. And I saw that progression more clearly um, that instance than I ever had before. I just, I just think that is such a, an essential point for people to understand about addiction, that, that if, you, if you pass the line mm -hmm. and you develop what we call brain addiction, that clearly, clearly, all the research in the world shows that the safest course of life for you is to abstain from psychoactive chemicals. It's not the kind of thing where you have a 10-year addiction you become sober for 10 years, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you can start drinking bourbon because right. you haven't drank bourbon for 10 years. The research shows that there's certain brain pathways that are dormant, and they can be reignited mm -hmm. with the introduction of a psychoactive chemical. So this is really important for people in recovery to understand, mm -hmm. and I think it's really important for the general public to understand. 
So if you're, if you're having a party at your house, you can probably bet that there'll be a few people coming that are in recovery from alcoholism right. or some addiction. You may not know it mm -hmm. because people don't broadcast it, but let's have some drinks that are non-alcoholic. Let's not make people feel uncomfortable if they're right. not drinking. Right. Let's have some consideration. People do it with people who just eat vegan foods or have to, uh, you know, have a special diet. You'll see more and more menus accustomed to that. Yeah. Let's do that with substances too. Let's welcome people who, who choose to abstain. And um, mo most people, I, I do believe that most people in recovery learn that lesson the difficult way. Every, every, every person's fondest desire is that someday they'll be able to you know, use something casually or socially. Mm -hmm. They attempt to do it, and lo and behold, it's very often a, a relapse. And sometimes uh, if a person relapses and is reluctant to seek help again, mm -hmm. the outcome, uh, outcome can uh, be death. Right. Absolutely. So if you wanted to speak a little bit now directly to your, your peer group out there, mm -hmm. what, would, what would you say to them? You know, I would say when I... You know, before I, I entered in, into recovery, I couldn't see, I had no idea that I could change. I could, I could change the way I was acting, the way I had been acting for years. I was always that, you know, curious kid trying to hang out with the older kids and trying to, to be cool. And, um, and I couldn't see that there was another way of life. And that's because the way my brain is wired is to, uh, I have an addictive personality, you know? I, I like to use things in excess, and I, I like to, you know, I like to use drugs and substances to, to mask my feelings. I like to. So I, I would say, you know, once you do get help, once you, you break that barrier, there is another life out there waiting for you. You can turn around, you can change. Um, it's absolutely possible. And don't be afraid to ask for help because it, although it may seem that no one cares or that no one you know, wants to help, helping other people is, is a part of my recovery. Like I need to help other people because it brings me back to the time that I was in their situation. I desperately needed help. Yeah. And talking, talking with, with young folks in recovery helps me stay sober myself because I get to relive those experiences see where I went wrong and what I've done to, since then. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. And I, I think that's one of the main uh, messages uh, for the audience today, that, that out there, there are, there are many, many people who understand this disease. There are many people waiting and willing to open their door to help you. We'll put up a couple of slides now for college students in Vermont and also for college students nationwide. And we'll put up some slides for public information as far as getting help for people with addiction. But, but what I'd like you to know, what I'd like you to take away from the program, is that there are many people out here who care about you, like, like Cliff, like myself, like Channel 17, for giving us the time to have this forum to try to reach you. We, we understand also that it's not easy. I don't, I don't want to give the impression that I think it's easy to break through shame or break through reluctance or break through fear and expose that vulnerable part of yourself that needs help. We, we know it's not easy, but we would just ask you to, to listen to feel the message that we're trying to communicate to you. We do care. And, um, you know, we want you to, to reach out when you're ready, and we'll be here for you. Thank you. Thank you.